Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Would well, you remember back last June that large dust plume that came across the Atlantic Ocean in the Saharan air layer? Well, the Sahara Desert is at it again, and that's what you can see here. Over the weekend, we saw yet another large plume of dust that was coming off uh, of the desert. But what was interesting was what was happening in the North Atlantic. Deep winter storms, big cyclones were spinning in the North Atlantic, as they typically do this time of year, and actually pulled a lot of that dust just yesterday right here across the Mediterranean and into this system. Now, there's still quite a bit of dust out here in the open Atlantic, but it's just unique to see how far we can move the dust away from the Saharan Desert. Now, to show you what's going on today, there is a deep low pressure system still sitting here in the North Atlantic, and it's a powerful one. But why I'm showing you this animation is to actually have you focus in on this high pressure cell right here. That is actually the end of a series of high pressure cells that over the last well, almost 15 days have come out of the Canadian prairie, come into the Midwest and high plains and the central plains, cut all the way down to the Gulf Coast and have moved finally off the east coast of the United States. Now thinking back on that, I just want to tell you something that my good friend and colleague, Professor Jeff Frame at the University of Illinois said. He put out on a tweet last week, he said, you know what, that anticyclone, that big high pressure cell that was sitting right here, might have been one of the largest and most destructive and damaging and costly high pressure cells in history. And what I'm saying here is that the high pressure that you found in this area at multiple times exceeded um, what, 1040, 1040 millibars? And when you just reconstruct all of last week, this is showing you how high the pressure was compared to normal. Now, what's important about this was that, yes, right along this area, we saw destructive ice storms. Uh, we saw heavy snow on the northern side of this. But if you recall, we did not see at all last week like a deep low that went racing into this area. It was all on the nose of that really cold air. And just to show you one last map to kind of put last week into perspective, from February 3rd to February 21st, that's more than that last week, this is almost the whole front half of the month here, each climate reporting district has a number in it. And on the 129 years worth of data that we have, the closer you are to 129 would be the coldest such time period in February on record. There have been very few times going back, gosh, this is all the way back to the early 1890s, that this section of the country has been colder at this point in February than it was last week. Now from there, this is yesterday's satellite animation just up to sunset here. And I was watching this primarily for two things. There was a pretty potent cyclone that was going through parts of Iowa and into Wisconsin. And we call these overachievers because last Thursday did not see this capable of producing the amount of snow that it did produce in Iowa. And then again, as it moved here toward the Great Lakes in the overnight hours. But I was watching a couple of things here. Notice we still have a large area here in the Dakotas that is snow free. You can see the snow swath coming out of Wyoming, cutting through Nebraska. But to the south of it, uh, look down here, the snow is finally melting away. In fact, you can see the last little bits of it melting right there on the Red River. So we're seeing some changeover here in, in the snow. Now, speaking of snow, it would be good just to toss in a map that shows you the last nine days through yesterday evening at 6 p.m., just total accumulated snowfall. Notice, again, that system last night putting down, or yesterday, putting down all that snow in eastern Nebraska, cutting through Iowa. And this does not capture what the tail end of it was. But the, some of the heaviest snows down here in parts of Louisiana, Texas, Arkansas, just, I mean, just incredible to say the least. I want to keep you up to date on what's happening in the West as well, because when we look at our accumulated snowfall departure map, and again, I forgot to change the date on this map, I'm sorry, but this is through the February 21st, so this is through last night. What we notice again is uh, the snow deficits that are here in the Northern Plains, many locations well over 30 inches in North Dakota snow deficit. Uh, going east of there, uh, right here along the Great Lakes, although we've had some good lake effect snow, the seasonal uh, numbers are down here 30 to 40 inches. Same thing in Maine as well. But if you come over here to the western part of the United States, parts of the Sierra Nevada are still sitting between 40 and 100 inches in deficit. And the map I want to bring you up to speed on is this one, which looks at the basin average snow water content. Now, as we keep looking at these maps throughout the next several weeks, the idea is to see a lot of these numbers by the end of March be very close to 100. That would be ideal. And right now, it's really only the Cascade Mountains and pockets in the northern Rockies that are sitting at over 100% of normal water in the snowpack. The Sierra Nevada here in the 70 to 80% range. All right. 
From there, let's go take a look at today's all hazards weather map. And probably most of your attention is drawn here to the Northern Plains where there are high wind watches and high wind advisories out. Uh, we are still dealing with uh, so some fog on the backside of that system that rolled through Iowa last night and the winter weather advisories along the east. But just to show you what's happening today in the high plains, getting all the way here up to um, you know the northern plains in the Canadian prairie, by midday today we could see wind gusts here that are easily, you know, 30 to 40 plus miles an hour. A couple of gusts in there getting well above that. But the flow direction coming over the mountains, then going down slope here, means that the temperatures here are really going to warm up. And just take a look at this. This is the European model's forecast for surface temperatures today uh, at noon. Now I put a hard contour at freezing, so you can see the places that are going to be below freezing at noon today. What I want to tell you this, I mean all the way north of what, Highway 16? The entire northern plains, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, we've, we've got much warmer temperatures that are in place. We could be seeing temperatures today in Montana over 50 degrees. Rewind the clock just, just to the beginning of last week where we had minus 40 to minus 50 degree temperatures here. What an incredible swing in temperatures we've had in the northern plains over the last week. But as we look out over this next week, I want to put it into the context of our last two weeks of total precipitation. Nearly every one of these weather systems missed the northern plains here in the Dakotas, northern Minnesota, Wisconsin. It wasn't just until last night that we saw snow here. You can see that despite the cold air and the snow that came with it, we've over the last two weeks been drier in the southern plains toward Missouri. The wettest places by far look up the east coast, where some places here were picking up six to eight inches of rain last week. Uh, this has been one of the wettest starts to a year on record uh, right up here from you know parts of Georgia through the Carolinas up into the mid-Atlantic. We're going to talk more about California in a few moments and some precipitation signals coming in the middle and end of March, but very dry there as well. Well, over the next week, the European model looking at precipitation anomalies continues with the split flow uh, pattern in the Pacific Ocean, hence the drier conditions that you see here, at least through the next seven days in parts of California. But there is some hint of a, of a large subtropical ridge that's beginning to form here. It's actually not a hint. The models are really kind of screaming it at us, uh, putting this big ridge here over you know, parts of the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean, and the Atlantic. And to the north of it, we're going to watch for the potential for very heavy rain from the Red River Valley here all the way through the Mid-Atlantic. And this is going to be the target area. Now, do notice through the Canadian Prairie, through the northern plains, starting to see more of a semblance of, of normal precipitation pattern through the next week. But if I focus in right into this area, I'd like to show you kind of a multi-model analysis. So there's the GFS. If we go back and forth, there's the European, the GFS. A lot of the excess precip you see here was the GFS was slower with last night's system. So that's some of that's from last night. But very uh, similar corridor here. But the GFS has actually got a new version that's coming out. It's called the GFS V16. I love the name. I'm kind of a big car guy, so to see it called V16 is kind of fun. But we'll start showing this as well. And you can see that it is also painting that same corridor as having above average precipitation through the next week. Okay, from there, I want you to pay attention when we watch this pattern to just a couple of features. The first is going to be the ridging that you're going to see in the Gulf of Alaska. And the second will be this. This is the tropospheric polar vortex. Now, my main goal here is to show you these two features and how they respond to this subtropical ridge that keeps setting up here. So let's watch it together. As it plays forward, you notice that the pattern keeps dropping deeper troughs. Watch it again along the western side of the United States here and there and another one here at the end. This is 10 days of animation here. The tropospheric polar vortex just keeps meandering around parts of the Canadian archipelago and just moves basically from here to here, just north of the Hudson Bay. As we watch it one more time, can you see the subtropical ridging happening down here? That is what's going to help set up the, the pump, the moisture pump, into the midsection of the United States, specifically setting up from Texas to Virginia here over the next, well, at least seven days. I do also want you to notice that by the time we get into early March, the operational European model wants to break down that ridge, shove it over here to the end of the Aleutian Islands. This is exactly what needs to happen, okay? This is exactly what needs to happen if California is going to start to recover some moisture in March. So remember, we're looking at a single operational model run. So as you go out farther in time, the reliability goes down. But we got to watch this trend carefully for those watching in California. But notice the ridging here 
into the early part of March. We got to talk about what that means in terms of temperatures in a few moments. First, our high resolution NAM model shows that the system that moved through Wisconsin gets on off to the northeast today. And it's followed by a couple of clippers. Watch them again here. So here goes system number one. Here comes a little clipper through the Great Lakes states and another one that spreads some snow out of southern Alberta and Saskatchewan through the Dakotas and eventually here over parts of the Great Lakes into Ontario. On the tail end of this system later today, we could get some showers and possibly some thunderstorms that come through parts of the Mid-Atlantic all the way down to Florida. Watch it again right in through here. So that's just another round of heavier rain hitting that already rain-soaked ground that is right here along the East Coast. But from there, why don't we flip over to the European model and take a longer look out at the development of these next few systems. So we've seen this is getting through uh, 6 p.m. tonight, now into early morning tomorrow morning, now getting in tomorrow midday and then tomorrow evening. What we notice is there's that clipper finally going through in the overnight hours on Tuesday, getting into Wednesday, there it is, moving through the Great Lakes states. But what you're going to notice here is a kind of a sandwiching effect again. So I've just let this play on out. Uh, to Thursday at noon. There's a high pressure cell sitting here and in the upper levels there's the ridge that's sitting down here over the you know the Gulf getting into the Caribbean. And the net effect of that is that going into Thursday evening, now getting into early Friday morning, that's where we start to see the heaviest rains beginning to set up in the forecast model. See that? Notice this entire time, I know I didn't focus on it, but the flow is still coming around this big high pressure cell targeting the Pacific Northwest from the Northwest. So this flow keeps coming in like this. And there is some light snow we're going to see throughout this week through the Canadian Prairie. But here we are on Friday, going into Friday midday, and then Friday evening. This will be an area that we're going to watch carefully. Now at the end of this week, the operational European model wants to start putting in snow here in the Appalachian Mountains between Virginia and West Virginia. And they kind of take that snow right up into parts of Pennsylvania and New York. And even on the back side of this, we see some snow um, on Saturday morning in parts of Wisconsin. Again, the heavier rain back here on this boundary. But I'll just say this, this single operational model run likely does not have that done well. But it's just the idea that once again, as you go out here to Sunday midday, do you see where things reinvigorated? Right back on that same area. But the only good thing I can tell you is that no, we don't need this excessive rain, but I don't see any ice in this. And that is some very, very good news. So that takes you out a week. Let's put it all together with respect to a snowfall map first. Remember what I told you about this. Not a lot of confidence in the evolution of this snow right in through here just yet. We have some snow, light snow, moving through parts of the Dakotas, possibly North Dakota, picking up two, three, four inches of snow, maybe a little bit more. And then two systems coming together of the Great Lakes. This is why we see the snowfall amounts here higher. The Sierra Nevada missed because the flow is split, but the Cascades, again, getting a big dumping of snow here throughout the next seven days. But it's great to see some snow returning here to the northern plains where we've had so little of it. Let's do our same multi-model analysis here, looking at total accumulated precipitation. So this is the European model. Notice that in this area, possibility of two to three plus inches of rainfall right in through here. If I show you the operational GFS, it's wetter in this area, but remember, this is a lot of this was coming from the slower progression of last night's system. Okay, that's what you see here. But if we go from uh, the GFS now over to the GFS V16 version, it's got the same precip here, but just like the European, the GFS is finally at the end of, the ne of this next week, dropping lows farther to the south in California. Now, thinking about that, by the end of the week, take a look at the jet stream pattern staring down here over the North Pole. We have the Pineapple Express, but it's cutting through, well, it's cutting through Mexico and then heading all the way up here uh, toward, toward Maine. So this particular flow, the southwest flow in the jet stream is why we keep this area so wet. But remember, I told you to watch the breakdown right here. And the European ensemble, by the time you get out there, about day 11, starts to do that. Backs up the strongest winds in the subtropical jet here, which allows for troughs to start to cut into the Gulf of Alaska. And this is going to increase the chances for precipitation in California. It's not as though it's the wettest pattern. This is not wet by far, but it is no longer blocking things up. So as you look out there, the precipitation anomalies for week two start to back off. They stop showing 
almost no precip and start to bring stuff in. But with that jet stream pattern doing something like that in the subtropics, very wet into this region into week two as well. So that is not calming down at all. All right. From there, probability over the next 15 days, okay, or over the next 14 days, excuse me, of getting better than two inches of rainfall. This is from the European Ensemble. The probability in this area here is greater than 90%. So we are anticipating a lot of heavy rainfall in that area as we battle between a ridge to the south and a ridge to the north. Okay, let's now look out longer term. The European weeklies released on Friday once again continue to show uh, here along the west coast getting out into that time period of the 7th through the 14th better chances at precipitation for the west. No, it doesn't right now look as though it's going to be super wet, but to see it not as dry is encouraging. And the model again wants to keep this area more active as it also does here coming out of the Great Lakes into the northeast. From there, let's talk temperatures. Today's high temperatures, but compared to normal, look at how much warmer than normal it is here with that downslope flow. We see 50s in Montana, even in the Dakotas. Let's watch this progress forward. Tuesday, mild day across the midsection of the United States. In fact, all the way across the southern tier of the U.S. as well. Going from there, uh, from Tuesday into Wednesday's high temperatures, this is when we do have some cooler air coming in on the backside. So our first trough sweeps through. You'll see it there on Wednesday. So there's a cool down coming in Wednesday to Thursday back into the high plains here. All right. But still broad area of warmth in the northern part of the United States. But watch each shot of cooler air we're going to see moving forward is just that. It's a shot, not sustained like it was over the last couple of weeks. And it moves out for Friday. Here we go getting into Saturday. And here comes another shot of cooler air coming in on Sunday, right? From there, let's look out to the five to 10 day time period. We see that there is a bit of a model discrepancy here in the Canadian prairie with the GFS much colder than the European model is at this point. And to be honest, uh, we're gonna have to let this play out this week to see if that shows up there in that day seven through 10 time period. But across the South, the broad scale warmth while the colder air gets tucked back over the Western part of the United States. And that tends to be the pattern of getting all the way out to the day 10 through 15. And at that point, the models actually do have very good agreement on the temperature pattern moving toward, well, the end of the first week of March is what we're looking at here. From there, the polar vortex has retreated, as I talked about earlier. This is the stratospheric polar vortex, though. By day 10, it is firmly in place over Siberia and the Arctic. And the Pacific North American pattern appears to want to stay negative for a while. Now, what does that mean? That means that the jet stream is going to attempt to back this ridge up here toward the Aleutian Islands. We're going to get more, uh, more of a feeling of a trough in the west with broader ridging happening over the southeast. And the reason why we, we bring that up is twofold. That pattern tends to keep the western United States cooler than average, much of the eastern half of North America warmer than average. But that would be the best case scenario to get the ridge to happen here to get flow to come back into the west coast to revive some of the precipitation deficits for the west. That is the key thing I will be watching moving forward for the west coast of the United States to see if the models have this pattern down. Hey, thank you for your attention to start off this week. Hope you all have a great rest of your week and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks.